Okay, everyone, we're going to uh, get started. Um, I hope you are doing something to be warm. Um, <laughs> or, like sit closer to someone or, or move up. Um, so uh, my name is Jessica Waters. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Education and the Vice Provost for Academic Student Services. And what we wanted to do today was give a brief overview of the many new parts of the first year experience at AU, um, but then also really focus on what this means um, for your teaching or your interaction with students. Um, because I think it, it is fair to say that the first year experience um, at AU has fundamentally changed over the, the past couple of years, um, and particularly over the last semester. So making sure that everyone um, is aware of the changes that have happened um, and be, um, being able to adapt to that in the classroom, I think, is critically important. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of major pieces of the first year experience today, um, the AU core, the um, AUX program, the American University Experience 1 and 2, um, first year advising, and then also writing studies, and how all of these pieces are connected. And I think that is likely the most critical point here. Um, over the past couple of years, we've implemented a number of new initiatives, right? The first year advising initiative, the AUX curriculum, the AU core, um, but it's really critical to see how those pieces fit together. Um, none of these were done in a vacuum, right? They all built on each other and they were all designed to support each other, um, as were the changes that we made with um, the Academic Support and Access Center, right? These things were really deliberate um, and the pieces are, are interconnected in a way um, that I think has fundamentally changed the student experience. So as we're talking about the, the AU core um, and we're talking about the first year experience, obviously the complex problems courses and the AUX courses are the fundamental building blocks of the core. And those are what our first year students are taking. Um, and they really have changed the way that we approach that first year to focus on cultivating curiosity, um, cultivating um, uh, ways and habits of doing inquiry in an academic setting. But then also importantly, really focusing on the challenge we want to provide to our first year students and the support um, during those challenging times. Whether that challenge is academic in the classroom or whether we are grappling with, as we heard at lunch, um, some of the very real anxiety or depression issues that some of our students are struggling with. Um, so we really want to focus today on how these pieces connect how this might lead to a different first year experience that will change your classroom experiences and interactions with students, um, and then give you some tips uh, on, on how to do that. Um, so I will turn it first to um, Steph Woods, who is the faculty director of our AUX program. Thank you all. So in talking about AUX, American University experience. It's a full year, one and a half credit in the fall semester for AUX1, one, one and a half credit in the spring for AUX2. So full year curriculum, that's this cornerstone of the AU core. And the hope is that through these two classes, we're guiding, helping students to transition to college, how to college, how to adult, how to prepare to go into the world beyond AU, but also how to maximize that AU experience during their time on campus. AUX1 in the fall is focused and based on student development theory. And the course through this interdisciplinary approach is designed to help students navigate those first months at college, think about it, only a few months prior for first year students, they had to ask permission for the teacher to get up from their class in the middle of a class, and now suddenly they're away from all of their support systems, living on their own for months, and and then having to schedule their, their own itinerary with each day. So we're trying to tackle everything from budgeting and planning to grit and resilience to freedom of expression on campus, to campus resources and having a better understanding of all of the support systems that are here, all of the lifelines that they have to, to say, how can we help? There are people here who can do that. Let's make sure you're familiar with ASAC. Let's make sure you're familiar with the Title IX office. What does HPAC do? How does the Counseling Center work? And really equipping them with those skills. And also, dipping their feet into identity issues and trying to understand that these difficult conversations are happening. They're happening in dorm rooms. How can we bring them into the classroom under the guidance of an instructor and under this AUX model, a peer facilitator? So the student who was just in here, Alexis, taking photos, 
was one of those peer facilitators. And what's interesting about this AUX model is that it's a co-facilitation model. So there's a student and an instructor up here in the front of the class to say, right from that very first day, from that first class, you don't just have one person here in your corner, you have two. And then you're also going to be equipped with understanding the resources and who and what can help you to try to make that the best experience and maximize things from an academic perspective, but also a social perspective, a cultural perspective, and a psychological perspective to look at this transition and adjustment period from all of those arenas. AUX2, we're digging deeper into structures of inequality and power and privilege and understanding that the discourse is happening. The students know what happens in the news more often than not and the students are following what's going on and they're also seeing different conversations and interacting with those who have many different identities and experiences from themselves. So let's bring that knowledge, that socio-historical context into the classroom and provide some foundation for the discussions that are happening. Um, other things that are unique to the AUX model, and we have an instructor in the back here, and it's nice to, to have members of that AUX family here, is that it's a hybrid class, so they're going online. All of the resources are available online, so it's not just environmentally friendly, and green per CTRL, but it's also designed to say, okay, the students have some easily easy accessibility to all their materials from that very first day of class. And it's taught in living room lounge style settings. So these are four custom rooms throughout campus that have chairs that are a little more conducive to getting up, moving around, because <laughs> during those 75 minutes, it's an interactive experience. It's not a lecture-based, not a sage-on-the-stage kind of class. It's designed where it's discussion-based, there's activities, they're trying to both reflect on their own experiences and their thoughts on the reading and resources for that week, but they're also figuring out how does that help them fit within campus and within the class. Um, another great component about AUX is the instructors that are teaching it. And I will turn that over to Brianna to share about the unique model and how that's benefiting the students in really tangible ways. Uh, I'm Brianna Weedock. I'm the director of First Year Advising. And as Steph alluded to, um, the staff of First Year Advising are the um, uh, the instructors for AUX1 and AUX2. So in first year advising, our overall goal is providing holistic developmental academic advising and support to our first year students um, by incorporating all uh, their academic, their social, their cultural, and their psychological adjustment to college. So really looking at the whole student. Our approach is informed by um, the University of South Carolina's National Resource Center on the first year experience, as well as some really good research done on student thriving, specifically um, the research that's done by Lori Schreiner. And she makes the argument that measuring student success in college needs to look beyond just retention and completion rates and focus really on thriving as a measure of student success. So it's really no accident that our goal of providing this holistic um, service to student aligns with her, key three, her three key areas of thriving, which are academic engagement and performance, interpersonal relationships, and intrapersonal well-being. So we're looking at all three of those things in the AUX1 curriculum, but also in our um, work one-on-one -on -one advising with the students. So what this means is we're, we're focusing on the whole student, we're focusing on their learning and their engagement, both in the classroom and in the community defined as the AU community specifically. So we want them to get um, a really good introduction to the AU community to develop the ties, to develop the mentoring that um, is really necessary for students. Um, we are looking to help them develop resilient strategies so that when things go wrong, because they will, they will be able to bounce back a little bit. Um, assisting them in finding their place here so that they feel like they belong. Um, 
So what this looks like on the ground is when we are teaching the AUX1 class, we are in weekly interactions with the students that we also advise. So this kind of helps us to establish a baseline for what a norm is for that student. So when things start going awry, we can see that in the classroom and we can intervene earlier. Um, it assists in facilitating a faster connection between the student and the advisor um, by seeing us uh, once a week so that they feel comfortable coming to us and talking to us about what might be going wrong and also what, what might be going right. Um, I open all of my classes with a round of pits and peaks for the week, so and they're incredibly honest. <laughs> so I, I learn pretty quickly what's going on in their lives that are really great and what's not going so great. So I can, I can follow up with, um, with them after class. Um, the AUX classroom also assists in creating that small community for the students to feel comfortable transitioning into their new identity as a college scholar among other people who are going through that as well. So what we're really looking to do in that classroom space is to make it a safer space to talk about you know, the struggles of going from a high school community into, a college, um, into college expectations. This is especially helpful for um, first generation students um, to develop the cultural capital within the academy at least that other students arrive to AU already having. So um, all of the students, but especially the first generation students, are able to develop those mentoring relationships with faculty. We have um, a man an assignment for mandatory office hour visits and we teach them how to do it. Um, we help them develop the vocabulary of the academy, um, and they gain the knowledge of how to navigate the systems and the processes of the academy to help them become more savvy faster, um, so that they can also access the same resources and opportunities that other people, that other students who come to the university having um, had parents or siblings who have gone to college, they already come to the academy knowing those things. Um, so it helps us to level the playing field a little bit. Um, we also, outside of the classroom, engage in high impact practices to increase th thriving. One of those practices is our work with our academic probation students. Um, where we are seeing them once a week for in-depth academic coaching so that the students who have stumbled in the fall can get back up onto their feet faster and with more support during the spring semester. I'll report back at next, next year's Anne Fair and how that goes. <laughs> um, and then another such practice is modeling and fostering curiosity, which is so important. Um, guiding them through exercises designed to specifically introduce them to majors and minors across the university so that they can um, investigate and make sure that the major that they think they want is really the major that they want um, faster and giving them more information about majors maybe that they have never um, thought about before. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to our complex project. Um, should we do sure. a question now? Yeah. Can you talk more about the mandatory office hours? Who's doing the office hours from the property perspective? And also, what's been the response and feedback? So I think it's great to know, because then we can say, hey, you've already had good office hours. Why don't you now come to office hours? <laughs> yeah. So the, so the question is about um, office hours. Who do the students go to visit? Um, <clears throat> And what's the feedback? And what's the feedback on it? Um, so the students have to visit someone who is currently teaching them, who is not their AUX instructor. <laughs> that would be too easy. Um, uh, a lot of times they pick their college writing faculty, um, uh, and the feedback has been in their written work. I was really scared to do this assignment, and. I am really glad that I had to, and almost uniformly the feedback is, I discovered that my professor has interests and is a person. 
Um, and so it really serves to humanize the faculty. And I mean, going to talk to faculty is scary when you're 18. It's really scary. Um, and so helping them figure, we give them sample questions. We do some, um, some modeling of what that office hour might look like, things like that. Um, it seems to have, have helped kind of break down that barrier. The reason I ask is a few years ago I said yes to give a talk on campus. I didn't know what there was. I showed up and said, what's the topic? And they said, the fear of office hours. <laughs> that blew me away, um, but I learned so much from that and, and the fear there. And I'm also wondering is, are the students supposed to or not supposed to, or is there no, no instruction given in terms of saying, let the faculty know you have to do these things? this context. And the reason I bring that up, I think why this is so important, and I'm here, is for the faculty that are not teaching these programs to know what it is so that we can make the connections, relieve some of the burdens that we think are on ourselves, and, and, and learn what's happening that the students have already gone through. And I had noticed during one of the AUX pilots, without knowing this office hours assignment was an assignment, I had several first years come in to office hours, and the questions are broad, but the idea is you're not supposed to just come to follow up from something you could have discussed from class. You're really trying to recognize that we're all part of this community of learners, and to try to build that community even more and to find additional support systems. So I remember, you know, whatever I had to do during those office hours that I, I knew I wanted to do, and the questions were very much like, well, how did you end up at AU? And I'm, and I'm like, well, what do you want to know about class? <laughs> and it was like, oh, nothing. And I'm like, well, then why are you here? And this, the, this student didn't tell me, but in more recent years, since people know I'm, I'm aware of the assignment and the timing, they have shared that. But I think it was this idea to say, we all, wear a lot of hats, students and faculty alike, and to really allow this opportunity to have a discussion and to make connections in different ways. Um, and also the, the idea to build on, you know, what the first year advisor instructors are doing, to say to think beyond just one silo, one major, one idea that you had in high school, and really embrace curiosity and that inquiry um, within learning and to be open to different paths um, that all bring us to AU. And that office hours aren't always transactional about how can I do better, even though that's great, mm -hmm. but beyond that. Yeah, and this, you know, Scott, to your point, um, I think uh, we have gotten better at but can still do a better job of making sure that faculty across campus know what's happening um, during that first year in a very deliberate way. Um, and, and the office hours example is a very good one. I, I was happened to be about two years ago, so we've been piloting this model, this is our, we did two years of pretty intense pilots um, of AUX, we did the year of the first year advising pilot, and we rolled out in full this fall. Um, but two years ago I was at a faculty senate meeting, and I said, I made an offhand comment of, you know, we had the mandatory office hours assignment this week, and a member of the faculty senate who was not involved in AUX said, oh, that's why I had all those students in my office, right? Um, so this year when we um, did this assignment, we actually proactively emailed all the associate deans in each of the units and said, hey, let your faculty know this is the week. They're all going to be coming, right? And that, that matters because you have a different approach to a student who comes into your office because of a mentor assignment and a student who shows up on their, of their own volition, right? That you ch changes how you think about it. Um, the other thing we'll be doing this semester to this same point, um, we have completely redesigned um, pretty fundamentally the AUX2 curriculum. Um, we established a university-wide AUX2 council. I see uh, Tracy Dennis from the School of Education who is on that council. Um, we'll be each week emailing out to all of the undergraduate associate deans, here's the topic being covered this week. right? Because if you have students coming into your class who have just spent 75 minutes talking about racial formation, you probably want to know that, right? Or if they've just spent 75 minutes talking about intersectionality, and suddenly they're saying, hey, have you thought about, like, Crenshaw, right? It's, it, you need to know that. The faculty who aren't involved in the that programs really need to know that. That would really help if you're topic or things in the news, you mm -hmm. might then say, let's do this, because you know they just talked about that, right? 
Yeah, um, and you know, for, for all of you in the room, um, we will enroll anyone who wants to be enrolled in both the AUX1 class and the AUX2 class as students. So you can actually see the entire curriculum, every assignment, every, you know, so um, I'm Blackboard, so um, you can email me, you can email Izzy Stern, yes, you don't have to actually go to the class, sorry. Um, we will enroll you in the Blackboard class um, so that you can have uh, insight into, you know, each week and everything that's happening. So, um, so the spirit of uh, application and execution, how do we enroll in the Blackboard? You can email me. Yep, waters at American.edu, and then I will email it to Izzy Stern. <laughs> yeah, okay. waters at American.edu. Tracy. Sorry, I have a question. Um, I really like what you were saying, sorry, Dr. Quick, about the academic, like focusing on the students who have academic challenges in um, second semester. However, when we do the early warning, has there any, been any talk about capturing them first semester, like as soon as the early warning? Because I do feel like, I don't, I don't always know where my early warning, um, if they're freshmen, um, like I wanted to find out if there's an intentional way that students are being followed up with in addition to us, the faculty, in terms of, of what you were saying. Yes, um, we um, follow the same practice that other advising units actually follow across campus with the early warnings. So we do outreach to the students. Um, the one to try to get them into our offices to talk about what the early warning of, is about. The one advantage that we have that other advising units don't have is we see them every week, and so if they have not responded to our outreach, we can pull them aside and say, hey, after class, we're going to go back to my office, and we're just going to have a quick chat, um, see what's going on, make sure you have um, touch base with your faculty member, things like that. Yeah. One other quick point, in thinking about what sets the model apart, nationwide, on average, most academic advisors are ha, um, have 300 to 350 students. For the first year advising model, and remember they're seeing each other each week, is it's 76 students on average. So it's the, and the same 76 students that they're teaching. So what that means, for our community and what that means for the interactions and also how they're shepherding into the department advising programs after that first year and really, you know, working to pass them along in a more thoughtful way. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Marsh, uh, I'm one of the faculty directors of the Complex Problems Program and, and I'm Chuck Cox and I'm the other faculty director of the Complex Problems Program. Uh, so complex problems, uh, those of you who have t already taught the program know this, um, but complex problems is deeply invested in taking our high school students who arrive during the first and second semesters and orienting them to the intellectual methods of the university. Uh, the methods that we're using in the curriculum, if you picked up our handout on the way in, are, are described by the learning outcomes of the program. And we're asking students uh, in each of these classes to do a number of things with their minds. Uh, the first and most important is to look at these problems from a diversity of perspectives. The same thing that academics across fields do when they have a question or problem. They look at it from a variety of different attitudes to try to understand it better. Uh, the courses also stress the importance of communication critical reading and reflection or metacognition, which we usually say to students is like, this is how you think about your own thinking. This is how you think about the ways you approach problems. And if you turn that handout over, you'll see on the back the, the wide array uh, of different course titles that are taught across the university. And the thing I love about complex problems is that it takes those intellectual methods that are defined by the learning outcomes and it says these are actually things that we can do in every discipline uh, at the university. Um, these are these sort of core liberal arts <coughs> methodologies that everybody uses. We call them different things inside of our academic disciplines, but this is the core that holds inquiry together. Um, the thing that we are, um, I think, most invested in is orienting students to a culture of intellectual difficulty. Often, 
they arrive from high school with the idea that they should already know the answer. I mean, there, there's this sort of, this is where the sort of like rage for the A comes from. They've earned A's in high school and they think that earning A's in college should, should be a similar kind of calculus. Uh, but in many ways it isn't because they don't have the methods of inquiry that we use at the university to make new knowledge. And the idea that you should like, not know some stuff or that this should be difficult or that you should dwell in ambiguity and even your own confusion for a good long while before you know something is, I think, sometimes very foreign to them. These classes are designed to say, no, we go toward the things that we don't know. We go toward the difficult questions. Um, we abide in ambiguity and contradiction because those are the places where new knowledge can be made. Um, and so uh, the ends of that approach are to emphasize to students that this is not just about getting a credential, which is, I think, the narrative that many of them arrive at university uh, knowing from their high school experience. Right? You get your degree, and then you go to work, or you go to grad school, or you, you, know, you become a grown-up. But what we're trying to say is that, yes, we are a credentialing institution, um, but that credential is only valuable insofar as it is a sign of this deeper <coughs> intellectual work that is deeply involved in personal formation, becoming uh, a responsible citizen. All of those things that our curiosity leads us to do um, is what that credential stands for. And complex problems give students the methods for beginning that work during the first year. Oh, Chuck, talk about the... Um, <laughs> talk about talk about integrative learning. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't done that yet. Um, so one of the buzzwords that you're hearing uh, a lot on this panel is curiosity, and that's one of the, the hallmarks of these foundational courses. And one of the ways that we both try to engage students' curiosity and show them this um, difficulty is through the learning outcome of integrative learning, which basically is co-curricular activities, every section of complex problems, and they're all unique sections that are taught by one faculty member. So once that faculty member is done, a whole new course comes in. So these are unique courses, which is also part of the excitement that these students are getting a chance to spend a semester with an expert talking about something that the expert is passionate and curious about in a way that's different than their other courses. But the, the real gem of this is that every course is required to partake of at least three co-curricular activities which are designed to connect what's happening in the classroom with the world outside. And so that could mean going off campus. We've had co-curricular trips to museums, monuments, to communities, to uh, different businesses to see how professionals are putting these skills and, and answering these questions in the real world. And as well, bringing the real world into the classroom through guest speakers, through attending events on campus, and these are really exciting because they, they take that classroom learning and they make it something that they're not used to. That, that these things we're talking about are not just ideas, but they're actually put into practice by people all over the city and all over the world. And these uh, prove to be some of the most exciting parts of these classes. Well, and it really helps us emphasize one of the cool things about coming to American University, which is that you've got, you know, the whole city around you as an extension of our classroom spaces. Um, and because so many of our faculty are connected out in town, um, we can make those connections meaningful for our students. So at the same time that students are becoming professionally competitive, they're developing their higher critical faculties, they're learning how to be responsible citizens, and all those things are deeply aligned in the model that we're pursuing, right? It's not this sort of like opposing narrative of like, oh, you just gotta get your degree, and maybe you'll actually like, you know, learn how to think along, along the way, right? These things for us are aligned, and that alignment is emphasized by our presence in the city, um, and the co-curricular activities are a way of pointing that out to students. And uh, two other really important elements of the complex problems curriculum, uh, to go along with the co-curriculars, every section also has a program leader who is an older student who works with the faculty member uh, primarily on planning and carrying out those co-curriculars so that they have, a, a, and also serving as a kind of uh, 
uh, student mentor as well. So we have a, an echo of the, the facilitation model from AUX. Um, among other things, the program leader serves as an extra resource for students. Uh, they, they often hold either office hours or study sessions to help the students figure out how to deal with those difficult issues and lean into the uncomfortable spaces. And as I said, they are responsible for helping to carry out those co-curriculars to do a lot of the planning and, and, and executing of it. And another element that we are very uh, proud of is the University College, which is a living learning community that happens in the fall semester. It's not universal. Uh, about, about a third, I think it is, of our, of our fall students um, sign up for UC. It's a voluntary thing. You don't need to have any special requirements. It's not like a, an invitation program. If a student says, hey, I'm interested, they, they say, hey, I'm interested. And we have a set of complex problem seminars that we have set aside to be part of UC. And the, what that means is those courses are put into clusters, and those students in those clusters of classes live together on the same floor of Anderson Hall. So they are both taking classes together and living together, and we, the, those courses work together to create uh, additional activities to, to supplement what's happening in the individual classrooms. So, question. How do we know if well, our complex problems course is one of those? Well, we, what we do is we, we ask for volunteers um, first, and some folks are really excited to do this. And we basically, yeah, we, we, we tell you. Um, yeah, there won't be a surprise. You'll never be surprised with a section. Because yeah, last year, I, that's what it was, but I, I don't think I heard anything this year. So maybe I'm not? Um, or maybe you just grandfathered in, or <laughs> what? We'll have to check that. Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. In progress. Um, are you teaching this semester? No. Yeah. Okay. No, th well, so there's no UC in the spring. So you are not in oh, your... Yeah, it's a fall. It's a it's, fall, it's a fall only oh, thing. Excellent. Yeah, and for those of you who are, are here to sort of take back the info to yes. your different units, uh, having taught in university college, I can say that it is there is a more intense classroom dynamic because the students are living with one another. And they are having you know, the social uh, you know dramas of the first year, and those become part of the fabric of the course. I've been lucky enough that the students in my classes have used uh, that connectivity to advance the intellectual work of the course, but there is a certain kind of intensity to it that I think you'd want to, you know, assent to in advance uh, and not be surprised by. Uh, I think too that you know teaching outside of university college doesn't mean that you lose the energy of the curriculum. Uh, there are plenty of you know, co-curricular activities for the class, right? You're still doing those. Um, and there are some more general programming that we use so that you can get that community without necessarily having students who are living on the floor together. And the other piece of teaching in university college is that you are convening courses in the dormitories. So you have to be prepared for the student in the bathrobe um, at 9.45 AM, which is a weird thing, I have to say. Um, so that, that's another wrinkle of it. Um, and I think it suits some folks and it doesn't suit others. I enjoy it. Um, but it was fabulous. I thought it was I... great. Yeah, is there anything else you would say about it for people who are interested? Uh, I, I was, I, I just loved the energy and, and, the, and the fact that was, they themselves came up with all these things they wanted to do. They, they'd see a clip of a movie in class and say, can we watch the whole movie? And I'd be like, yes, and I will buy you pizza. <laughs> yeah, my and students... Then, and they'd be like, yes, well, I'll just bring my... PlayStation in and, and yeah. yeah no my 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 students right? totally went after it they the, the first year oh. they organized two trips completely without me and they were like hey professor see you later we're yeah. going to the thing and then they like brought back these pictures it was lovely right and that is I think one of the highest goals we can have right is to give students responsibility for their own education right not me saying check off this list of things you have to do but rather they're saying I'm curious about this thing and I have the resources at my disposal to actualize this on my own. And I think that's the kind of freedom that we're trying to cultivate with this curriculum. And the other piece of that, whether it's university college or not, is the community. Uh, even, I, I did not teach in UC, but in my complex problems class, I still saw that, that sense of community with, with, with having the program leader there as a guide, with doing the co-curriculars, and having this very intensive experience in the classroom uh, it's, it, of a piece with this idea that we're trying to reach the whole student, that learning happens in, in social contexts and not just solitary contexts. 
and a lot of the projects that complex problems faculty members come up with. We saw some amazing final end of semester projects from complex problems courses that were just amazing. Um, different art shows and videos and just these great um, presentations they did that really show not only the curiosity, but the kind of curiosity that can only come when you have this kind of supportive community around you. So I think two of the two of the themes that connect complex problems to the other elements of the first year experience are that sense of community, that sense of a support network, and that energizing of the students' curiosity. For those of you who are interested, we have proposal materials printed out uh, so that if you would like to propose a class, you can begin to read up on how to do it. Um, Chuck and I are also super happy to talk with you either in person or by email or on the phone about how to do this. Uh, some faculty members like to propose courses that are in their wheelhouse, like these problems that they've been researching for a long time. Other people decide to say, actually, this is something that I'm interested in pursuing more inquiry about, and I'm going to use this as a foundation to do that work. So I think wherever you are, these are courses that uh, fit themselves to inquiry um, and are, I think, the best reason to teach in the curriculum. And just as one quick other piece of that, um, lest you think you're you know, committing yourself for life, uh, the way we work it is if you are accepted, uh, your course is accepted, you run it uh, at least three times in three years and then it needs to be reproposed. So if you decide that you want to keep going with it, you can repropose. If you want to make radical alterations to it, try something totally different or step back, you have that, that choice. Right, and every student's taking a complex problems course now, so we need lots of sections, so come on. It doesn't hurt. Can I add one, one tiny piece? Is that I taught a complex problems class in the fall, and in preparing to teach first years, I was teaching more first years in a seminar than I had taught in six previous years combined. And I wasn't quite sure how to approach the process. And what I so appreciated was how responsive Chuck and Sarah are and how they will, if you need someone to walk you through, they have worksheets to really help make sure that your assignments are meeting those learning outcomes and satisfying things in creative ways. And they make it, I, I would just say, you really streamline the process in a way that allows us to focus on what we love about teaching, but make, making sure that pedagogy curriculum piece is where it should be also. So really appreciative to have the team. Thanks for that. Because it also dovetails into this community idea. One of the things I think Sarah and I have tried to cultivate as directors uh, is a community of teachers as well as of students. And I think we've achieved that in a lot of ways. Um, complex problems faculty are very, very eager to try new things and help each other out and collaborate. And it's been, that's been a wonderful part of this experience. So it's, it's a great program not only for students but for faculty as well. And that circles around to the students again. I think, too, that if you're planning to propose a course, you'll find the learning outcomes themselves incredibly capacious and suggestive. Uh, whenever I proposed the first time and I started thinking through how does my course do this and this and this, it really opened the course up for me to my imagination. And, and for that reason, I feel like it's been a, a boon to my own pedagogy to get to you know work my way into this curriculum. So uh, one of the things that many of you are probably thinking is um, this has been a huge investment on the university's part, right? If we think through all the things we just heard about, um, in this past year we have launched 120 sections of complex problems. We've launched 120 AUX1 sections, 120 AUX2 session, um, sections. We have 25 first-year advisors. Those first-year advisors each only have 76 students, right? Um, the scope of what we have undertaken is monumental. Um, and um, with that monumental um, investment and, and faith of the university community in these initiatives, um, comes with it a responsibility to make sure this stuff is working, right? To be continually assessing. Um, so there are two handouts um, that I wanted to highlight um, over there, um, focusing on the AUX experience and our assessment, um, and focusing on the first year advising assessment. And um, as I mentioned, we've run the pilots for two years, and now we're in full rollout. Um, and, and the results that we're seeing are fairly phenomenal. Um, when we talk about student thriving, we talk about student retention. We know the key predictors of whether students are going to thrive and whether they're going to stay at AU are questions of, do I feel included? Do I feel like I belong? Do I have an understanding of and access to resources? 
do I have someone who cares about me? And am I being academically challenged, right? If you get positive responses on those five things, those students are going to thrive, and they're going to stay at AU. Right? Um, so we've been measuring all of these various things um, over the past several years. Um, some of you may know that we annually do a uh, fall transition survey. So every first year student who comes in is surveyed in their fifth week of class. So we can determine how are they doing, right? And it's a way for us, one, to have a sense of are they acclimating to AU, are they getting what they need, but it's also a way for us to do really targeted outreach. Um, so the surveys are actually tied to their student ID numbers. So that if they indicate, I'm struggling with X, we can reach out to the appropriate campus partner or the advisor can reach out to say, hey, I know you're having some troubles with financial aid. How can we help? You've expressed that you're feeling depressed. Have you thought about going to the counseling center, right? So we can do really targeted outreach. Importantly, when we did that survey this year, we had an 83% response rate, meaning 83% of our first year students responded to that survey. So we had these indicators for each student. Um, because we've done this year over year, we're able to tie the fall transition survey results to ultimate thriving and retention measures. Um, and we're seeing um, across the board that um, our results have gone up dramatically um, in the past year. So on the question of, you know, it, AU is a place where I belong, we've seen across the board that the percentage of students who say yes to that question, which is the number one predictor of retention, has gone up 6% in one year. Um, moving that needle is incredibly difficult. Moving it six percentage points is groundbreaking. Um, importantly, when we look at our black students, that increase was 21% this year. We saw a 21% percentage increase. In terms of stu black students at the university, first year students, we retained all but one from fall to spring semester this year. That is phenomenal. Um, when we look at the question of do I feel included at AU, we're up seven percentage points from last year. Um, and we're seeing even more striking results among our black um, and Latinx students. On the question of am I familiar with university resources, we've seen gains between 6 to 22 percentage points in the last year. Right On the question of do I know how to access mental health services? Do I know how to access academic help? Do I know how to access physical health help or financial aid help? And am I more likely to use them? We're seeing tremendous gains. And again, because we have done this survey for many years, we can actually tie it to ultimate measures of outcomes. Um, we have also been, um, because this has been such a, a huge undertaking, um, measuring at each point what's actually happening, happening with registration and retention. Um, and when we look at the retention data from our pilots, we can see that students who were in AUX and had a first year advisor are retaining at roughly four percentage points above those who did not, right? And so that's from two years ago. So we're looking at now our sophomores. Again, when we talk about retention at a university of our caliber, it is astounding to move that needle one percent. You've probably been in budget discussions where you've heard people say, we're at 88 or 89 percentage point, um, 89 percent retention. If we could get to 91, that would be phenomenal. We're seeing gains of four and five and six percent in terms of retention. Um, when we look at the question of uh, fall registration readiness, and again, a key predictor of whether a student will ultimately retain, we look at the question of is a first year student registration ready? Meaning, do they don't they don't have any stops on their accounts that would prohibit registration for spring classes, right? Because again. If they register in a timely way, that is a predictor that they will ultimately retain at the university. Um, for fall 2018, 97.3% of our first year students were fully registration ready by the first day they could register. Again, when we look at the data from previous years, this is a significant increase. And I will tell you that historically, when we've looked at that data, the students who were not registration ready were black males. And I just told you, that we had every single one, about one, sorry, all but one of our black students retained and registered by that date. Again, phenomenal data. Um, when we look at our fall to spring registration rate, so our first year students who have registered for spring classes, we're at about 98% of our first year students have registered for spring classes that start on Monday. It's the highest rate the university has seen in over a decade. So putting together these pieces, this monumental undertaking, the fact that they have first-year advisors who only have 76 students, who see them every week in the classroom, 
that they have this transition to college course, they have this access to resources, um, and then they're having this intellectual challenge in that first semester, it's, it's, um, it's leading to some good stuff. Um, I will tell you that you know we, we have a measure, we have a 41 point assessment plan um, that every sing, about every other week we are measuring something like this and I hold my breath every week um, and you know wake up in the middle of the night thinking, okay, where is that registration ready this number? Um, and it, I do. Um, and uh, I, I will tell you that when, when Jimmy Ellis, who is the assistant dean in my office, came in with these um, numbers a few weeks ago, um, I said, Jimmy, my eyes are suspiciously wet now, right? Um, because to see these numbers, to see this actually playing out, and to like, get these numbers, if we have 98% of our first year students registered, I mean, that's why we do what we do, right? That's why we're here. Um, so to see, um, to see this, this working um, on our team in, in really close partnership um, with multiple offices across campus, most notably um, the office, office of Campus Life, um, it has been uh, really gratifying and, and thanks to the work of a lot of these people. Um, so I'm now setting Kelly up <laughs> to talk about how we do this, um, you know, what this means once they get beyond some of these classes and how it translates into the rest of the academic experience. Well, that's right. So I'm Kelly Joyner, I'm in the Writing Studies program. I teach. Um, college writing. Um, so I just wanted to tell Brianna and Steph, so I had probably eight students come visit me to interview me <laughs> in the fall. No, no, no. Uh, and one, one time I had a student uh, interviewing me and then another student popped her head in the office and, and said, oh, you're doing that interview thing. Can I, can I piggyback? So she came in and she sat down and she said, so what brought you to AU? <laughs> and the first student said, yeah, I already asked that question. <laughs> so, um, college writing courses, um, we're, I'm interested, we're interested to see uh, how what, uh, what we do in college writing is resonating across the core. Um, if there's healthy redundancy, if it's being reinforced in good ways, um, if there's maybe unhealthy redundancy, so that would be useful to hear. But, so, I had a handout, if you didn't get one there, they're on the table over there. The um, uh, college writing and, and uh, writing studies handout. So on one side is the course objectives for writing 100 and 101 and 106. And just to, to say about that, that, um, that college writing is m more than putting sentences and paragraphs together. It's about interacting with inter information that's already out there. So that resonates across the core and that resonates with what uh, Sarah and Chuck were saying about complex problems. Um, on the other side of my handout, so I've got this list of bullets at the top. College writing courses are taught by writing studies program faculty. These courses contribute to the core by teaching and reinforcing these things. And I'll just blow through these. Reading skills such as how to read like a writer, information literacy skills, um, writing for the conversation, which is big, and that certainly resonates across the core. Uh, writing as a recursive process, developing a thesis, how to be an, an effective self-editor, uh, responding constructively and generously to the writing of peers, so it's not just living in a bubble. Um, citation style is rhetorically motivated and in involving discipline-specific and form-specific decisions. So, yeah, we teach them how to write MLA in Chicago and APA, but it's it's not just because by some miracle your other classes are going to make you do that. I mean, there are rhetorical reasons to use different styles, and that, that needs to be understood. Uh, how to prepare for and get the most out of conferences with professors, so that resonates with AUX. How to do college. How to read and understand assignments from other classes. My assignments are brilliant and very clear. The assignments in other classes may not be, and let me, let me tell you students how to read those other assignments. Uh, below that, I've got um, the most recent writer's witness text. So we, we like to talk about the writer's witness text as, as having um, resonance outside of the writer, um, uh, writing studies program. Um, writing studies faculty typically use the writer, writer's witness text to build community in the class, so that builds upon AUX. Demonstrate research-based writing with transparent citation and model effective argument, model discipline-specific approaches to a topic. Typically, we 
teach that book very first thing in the fall semester. Um, and I teach it uh, every semester. I teach 106 also, which is uh, 106 is uh, 101, 100, 101 combined for mostly honors and uh, scholar students. Um, frequently assigned uh, writing studies texts, and I put these on here because I th think you might consider using them in some way in, in your other classes. I think these resonate across the core. So, uh, rewriting how to do things with text by Joseph Harris. They say, I say, which is one of our, uh, if, if we all don't use it, I, probably 95% of us use it. Um, very useful. Uh, text. And then there's a web-based collection of articles that are written specifically with college freshmen in mind called Writing Spaces. And that's free. That's web-based and it's free. Um, Atrium, which is the Writing Studies Program curated uh, collection of AU student, I guess college writing student, uh, writing. Um, and the link to Atrium, so that's an annual collection, the link to Atrium is on the Writing Studies Program website, so you could access that yourself. Um, models of uh, great student writing, not perfect student writing, but great student writing, very accomplished student writing. Uh, many of us use The Danger of the Single Story by DJ, the uh, TED Talk by DJ, um, and we were talking about this, that um, probably the AUS classes and maybe some of the complex problems uh, use that uh, TED Talk because it's so accessible and you could just show snippets of it. Um, there's probably some redundancy. We teach uh, sort of danger of the single story assignments, but that's probably not an unhealthy redundancy um, because that message is, is something that they, that they really need to learn and it sort of applies you know, across different subjects too. Um, everybody should consider uh, using the Easy Writer, um, just the um, mechanical handbook and rhetorical handbook. Um, and then the last thing is my box on the right there. Uh, college writing students typically write in these information literacy dependent genres. All of those genres uh, show up in our classes. So getting them ready for not just the rest of their college career, but for their professional writing career. Uh, so it's not it's not just uh, putting sentences together and learning what commas are for. It's it's really getting them to interact with information, join a conversation, and figure out how that works. I wouldn't be averse to telling them what commas are for. <laughs> <laughs> also apostrophes. Well, we do that, but that's not the first thing we do. <laughs> Yeah. I miss the apostrophe. <laughs> <laughs> He's always getting late in the day. <laughs> I miss the apostrophe. Except when it's a place where it doesn't belong. <laughs> but also, I mean, the rhetorical reasons to teach them where the apostrophe goes, rhetorical reasons to teach them where the comma goes. It's not just do this, damn it, or else. It's, you know, there's, there's a reason. You're unclear if you don't put the comma in the right place, and that's important. I was pleased looking at the list that you had listed. Listicles and blogs. Um, are any of the items at all public facing, i.e., seen beyond the professor, beyond the university, or is it too early, or they too young for you worrying about public stuff, even though many of them are on social media and posting publicly for years? That's a great question. <laughs> So he's asking uh, are any of the assignments uh, producing public facing writing? Um, I think, by and large, we we don't do that, but there are some of my colleagues I know who, who do teach um, editorials, um, and they encourage or require them to submit them. Um, so it involves choosing a particular venue, figuring out what that venue is like and what kind of writing you could get uh, accepted at that venue, and then actually submitting it to the venue. Um, blog posts. Certainly, yeah. But I think, by and large, we you know we try to sort of cultivate the, the the safe space of you know this is just us looking at this right now. I, I know there are also a number of uh, writing faculty who encourage their stu there are a number of student research conferences uh, nationally and locally, and a lot of 
um, writing faculty will encourage students to submit their research assignments to those, and, and sometimes they, they get to go, and it's pretty exciting. One of the universal engagements of the Writing Studies program is something that in rhetoric and composition is called information literacy. This idea that one has to be aware of uh, the systems through which texts come to be in front of us. Um, and that in a digital world, that literacy is more important than ever. And so in that sense, I do think our students are getting an excellent education in methods for interacting public discourse, uh, evaluating uh, the evidentiary reliability of certain kinds of sources, um, and while they do that, like sort of listening and seeing where they fit into that conversation, uh, that that's a, I think a big piece of the work that is, in, I think, pretty universal in writing studies. So that, I think, is the big engagement with public discourse. Well, and I think that this is one of the places this point of, of healthy redundancy is really important because not only is that a focus of complex problems, that's a very um, significant focus of AUX2, um, focusing on the, this question of where does data come from? Where does information come from? Who has access to it? What's the validity of this, right? As we're teaching them to engage in discourse across difference, you know, we're very much stressing the idea of uh, we're, we're not as interested in, in what your opinion is, but how you got there and do you understand the systems of power that shaped it? Right, um, so there is a redundancy there, and one I would say is very healthy across writing studies, complex problems, and, and AUX too. Um, I will note that the, one of the um, more um, humorous and all good moments of the semester was when one of our writing studies students had to write an op-ed and wrote an op-ed um, against AUX one, and I said, like, "Okay, we're winning, right? <laughs> so they're, they're doing the thing we want them to do." So. Sorry, we need to answer sort of general questions. Yeah, yes. sure, do it. I, yes. I wanted to ask you a question, Mr. Waters. Um, sort of just administratively, you were talking about all these in, in very legitimately impressive statistics. The ones that the ones struck me, though, was 83% response rate. Mm -hmm. How did you get an 83% response rate? <laughs> yeah, um, phenomenal for any survey ever. Had. Yeah, um, so they are, they are first year students, they're five weeks in and we tell them they have to do it. Okay. Uh, and they don't, they don't know yet that they can. But, um, and I'm being, a bit, I'm being a bit facetious. Um, I think one of the ways we got that response rate is that every single one of the instructors teaching AUX1, seeing that stu those students every single week could say, you need to do this this week, right? So it's that captive audience piece that you know, gets us response rates like that. And you know, importantly, that response rate the reason that is so significant is because then we could reach out to all of those students, right? I know that 83% of the class, we know what's going on with them. So the yeah. follow-up question was, do they understand going in that you might use their responses to personally respond? So they understand yes. you're not like, because that could seem kind of deceptive if they didn't know that was coming. We would not do that. Um, yes, they do. Uh, just a couple questions about complex problems. One is uh, for profs who are uh, volunteering to do it, uh, what does the age distribution look like? And I ask that because in my department, it's the young folks who've volunteered and stepped up to do it, A. And then B, uh, related to that is, um, if, if you can think of anything to get the word out uh, about how exciting this is, uh, I'll certainly do what I can, but uh, to the older folks and let them know that this is fun and it's great and it's, it's amazing. And I guess I actually have a third question, sorry. But that is, um, uh, how do you deal with the problem or the issue or the question of uh, uh, workload? Because um, I've heard anecdotally that some students come into complex problems thinking it's a freshman, very easy class, low, low level of reading, low level of work. Some professors have the exact opposite impression going in, and, and there's not much balance across the board. Wow, oh, OK. Well, first question is the easiest one to answer. We we do have a pretty good spread of age. I mean, we even have one of our one of our standard every semester faculty is emerita, um, so we have everybody from folks who are relatively new to emerita faculty. So we we, we have a pretty good spread. Um, getting the word out that's that's something we're eager to work on ourselves. We we're um, fortunate that we have a lot of faculty who are willing to share results. Um, some of those projects I mentioned earlier, so we're working on it. Um, if you want to help us out, please contact us. We'd be happy to do a dog and pony show for a department meeting um, to you know, pass on information. Uh, we'd love to get the word out. 
question. Yeah, so to the third question about the difficulty of the classes, this is uh, something, maybe the biggest thing that we will have to work on as the, the program, uh, you know, develops. One of the things that we focus on in the course proposal process is emphasizing to the faculty members that we want rigorous readings, but not like a ton of them. Um, the idea is to focus students' engagement so that they can dive deeply into the material uh, instead of covering you know, broad swaths of material at a very shallow level. It's more important for us to go deeply. And so what we encourage faculty to do um, is to select representative texts. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't teach hard material. I give my, my kids Foucault, we, and we read, but we read literally three pages of it so that we can get real deep into what he might mean by this, this phrase, the clinical gaze. And they love it. They and they and then it gives them, I think, a sense of confidence. And I'm here. I'm thinking about those first gen students who now know a thing about what Michelle Foucault says. And when they go to their other classes, they have strategies for saying, "Okay, here's Foucault. He's really tough. A, I have to accept that I'm not going to understand everything. Certainly not on the first time through. And second, I'm going to have to give myself time to engage with this reading in a deep way." And having that strategy, I think, is a really vital one for students who may feel intimidated by, you know, the, the more difficult theoretical work of the university. And so when we, are, when we work with faculty to develop the courses, it's not that we're saying, oh, please dumb this down, this is summer camp. Like, that is not what Complex Problems is. Um, what we are saying, though, is that let's give this to students in a way that we can actually support. Because, you know, these aren't graduate students. These are we get high school students and we have to, to transform them into, into people who could potentially one day go to graduate school. So that's the thing we're working on. Um, you know, Brad was good enough to help us out um, with the academic rules and regs, uh, exactly how many hours outside of class should students be spending on their readings for complex problems. Um, now that we have you know, a better sense of what the courses look like on the ground, we are in a much better position to advise faculty on like, literally how many pages does this look like, and then uh, by extension, what's the conversation look like in class. This semester we're interested um, in offering some <coughs> faculty development in how to teach critical reading, uh, because that, that piece of the pedagogy uh, is really critical if we're going to engage in deep ways. We have to give our faculty methodologies for telling students how one does this, right? We're not, it's not the practice that probably most of us were educated with, which is just like, here's, here's all this stuff, you figure it out. Um, and eventually, you know, you sort of sort of through and get there. Um, we want to be <laughs> explicit with students about the intellectual methods that, that we're using when we engage with the text, things that we're not used to, used to like externalizing, um, but that's what this class does. Does that answer your question? Okay. We're working on it. Hey, oh, just kind of just really quick before I'm going to piggyback on that. Another, the other piece of that puzzle is the other, um, we, we try not to micromanage the, the individual courses at the content level, but in terms of things like two of the principles that we try to emphasize are the less is more when it comes to reading deeper dives into fewer, more challenging readings, and also when it comes to, to writing assignments to not have high stakes assignments, uh, which you know, we don't want students to feel like all this work is coming down to two papers that are worth 50% each, but giving them a lot more smaller opportunities. And sometimes I feel like, especially with first year students who aren't used to, to our, our ways of working, that can feel a lot of smaller assignments somehow feels more onerous than two big ones. Um, and so I think there's that perception that we're trying to encourage faculty to, to scaffold more and encourage students to take more risks with smaller assignments that they couldn't do with one big test and one big paper. And I think in terms of spreading the word more, there's the green chart that we shared up front to look at the core as a whole and, and those courses which would be housed in the department versus housed under a, a core class and recognizing how you know, teaching complex problems can feed into classes in your program in your department the next semester and can help be a way to recruit majors and how things can work together. You can, as a faculty or staff member, 
apply to teach AUX2 in the spring, as several are doing this semester, and recognizing how those classes could build well, not only into your department and major, but then could set you up to possibly have a strong uh, div and equity proposal for one of the classes housed in the major. So thinking about how all the pieces work together and how the core supports programs, but programs then support the core. And that's really where we build this community of learners. Question here and then we'll keep Could you speak a bit about the Washington semester program, uh, spring admits? I know traditionally there's been frustration and uh, feeling of disconnect from those students. <coughs> Spring admits are enrolled in AUX 1, so there are <coughs> six sections offered in the spring semester as compared to approximately 120, 100 in the fall. So they will be taking AUX 1 with the same curriculum, and then there will be fall sections offered of AUX 2. Um. I'll say that the partnership has been very deliberate. So we've worked really closely um, with Diane Lowenthal, um, Associate Dean, and, and Specs um, to make sure that the um, courses taken in the first semester as mentorship students are feeding into that second semester. Um, we also um, have been pretty deliberate in how we transition those students from their mentorship um, academic advisors into the unit-based advising structure. Um, so I actually think there's been much more attention placed on that um, in the past year um, than we've done in the past. I see Emily shaking her head yes, or nodding yes. Um, Emily is the uh, Director of Advising at CAS, um, and I, I think that's something we've worked really hard on. Um, we're doing similar things with the IEP program. I see Amy, um, I mean, we had a two and a half hour meeting yesterday um, talking about how to make all of this work, right? How do we make sure that um, as we put together these macro interventions that we're not losing or, or um, ignoring um, any of our smaller student populations? Tracy, and then yes, and then sorry, and maybe I'm missing. Where does the diverse experiences courses fall in? The, um, those are the diversity and equity courses. Um, so the DIV courses. Um, so when students are um, part of the AU core, AUX two is the introduction to those concepts. The DIV courses, which can be in the major, outside of the major, anywhere across the university, are one of the second steps there. So um, ah, part of the core, but after the first year. Okay. So um, I think that there's, uh, in, in, in my unit, in this, I think there's been a little confusion about um, why there's so much uh, coordination and check back and so on. And to some people, this looks like you're interfering with my academic freedom. You're supervising my syllabus. Uh, you're telling me what to do. You're telling me this isn't good enough. I am an acclaimed teacher. How dare you? And so on. And um, I, I think it's so moving to hear the incredible effectiveness of this program and the, and the way that you've been able to document the results of what it means to support and this, what's at stake for AU and how much has been invested. And the fact that this is faculty driven, I, I just think those are really important big umbrella themes to make sure that all of the specific information gets housed under so that people feel like I want you know I want to join that team not like you know if I do this course I'll be controlled mm -hmm. so I think one of the things that's been very important for us as we look at new courses for the complex problems curriculum uh, is to frame those proposals as a conversation. Uh, we, we do not reject classes. Um, it is an ongoing process of revise and resubmit uh, until the course can get approved. We want the courses to run. We want representation from the faculty. Um, we especially need representation from stuff that you might not see represented in this list, right? I mean, these have been historically pretty easy fits for uh, disciplines in the humanities, the sciences are are, are less well represented here. Um, that doesn't mean that they aren't, um, but we want this curriculum to be um, indicative of the work across the university. And to that end, having faculty from across the university 
um, is important. And so I think you know the the thing that, that Jessica always emphasizes is that you know we are part of an institution of critique, and we are here to hear feedback. We are here to hear dissent um, from our students, from our faculty members. Um, by hearing you know all the voices, uh, we can make the program really representative of what we mean when we say liberal arts education and that doesn't mean plowing people over it means like it means listening and accounting um, for for the experiences of everybody who teaches here so um, and I think to that end we've been deliberate about not rejecting courses about not saying well no you you just can't do that and the answer I think every time we get a question the answer is yes let's figure it out um, let's make it work um, so the more we can get that message out um, but I, I will say on a, on a macro level, um, we're under no illusion that we have gotten this 100% right out of the gate. Um, so I think there are things that we need to look at in terms of the curriculum review process. Um, certainly we've, we've heard from some associate faculty about that. Um, there are things we need to look at with the AUX curriculum and whether there are not good redundancies with, for example, Eagle Summits or other programs on campus. So it is has been, comp you know, since inception, all of these, it's been an iterative process for all of these things. So um, feedback, critique, criticism, incredibly welcome because I, I hope it's clear that our goal is to get this right right it's not to not to be right it's to get it right um, and that's that's a university-wide effort I think we have time for one last question I'll, I'll try to condense it down uh, it's a little controversial but, uh, uh, I, oh. really, <laughs> I, I really I really impressed with kind of what you described in terms of the approach about like preparing people to to tackle particularly complex problems. And, and I guess my question is in AUX, what do you, how do you engage students in uh, dealing with academic or intellectual problems which may also have an emotional or identity impact? In other words, like, I, like there are things that are not just theoretical for people, right? And yet it's an academic value to honor the debate, honor the discussion, even on things that may Piss you off. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, what? How are students prepped on the front end through that, or is there any just From the second week of class, they're watching Kayleen Jennings' class agreement video and setting up a class agreement amongst the group. In that will vary between sections, between instructors, between peers. So it needs to be something that works for that room. And they're in in the fall semester. They're watching and writing a short assignment based on the dangers of a single story video um, that Kelly had referenced and writing studies that build really effectively on that um, into a larger writing assignment. So it's a lot of reflection, it's critical re reading, it's, um, it's also those diverse experiences and perspectives and the idea that this, um, these disagreements and this discord will happen and these discussions will happen but the focusing on the point, not the person is a really common message throughout a lot of these class agreements and kind of this understanding as to how we approach the class. And a big focus is building that community of care and starting that early and having so many touch points. You see your advisor every week, you see your peer facilitator, then you go to complex problems, you also have two people in your corner and a better understanding of those resources. So I think going from class agreement to identity issues in that first semester and then building on them deeper in AUX2 prepares them better for both what they're encountering in classes after that first year and outside of classes. So I've, I've taught in the AUX pilot um, since the beginning. So I've taught AUX 1 and AUX 2 multiple times. Um, and I can say that what we're doing in AUX 1 is trying to help them set up a, a community in which they're able to have conversations across lines of difference. Uh, because they're carrying those skills into the AUX2 classroom, where we're talking very specifically about um, identities that people hold in that room. Every single person holds an identity that we're talking about in that room. We're talking about issues of power. We're talking about issues of privilege. For some of the students, this is the first time that they've ever heard of the concept of privilege. Um, and, you know, having taught sociology classes, uh, it's difficult sometimes to get people who have a lot of privilege to over that hump. Um, 
And so what we're trying to do is to really provide that space where it's okay to trip and it's okay to fall, but what's important is how do you get back up? How do you get back up and still have that conversation um, with somebody who maybe put their foot in their mouth? Or how do you have that conversation after you've been the person who've, who has put their foot in their mouth? Um, and that's a really, really important skill, not just in the academy, but in the, the world. Um, and so it's our hope that in that small space, we're able to create that community where students are able to make those mistakes and learn how to bounce back from them. That, yeah. um, so people seem really interested in this, right? <laughs> uh, invite us to your units. We are happy to come talk to any of you, all of you, all the time, every day. Um, so please, uh, let us know if you can be helpful in any way or any information.